Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day you have made and we rejoice in it. It's a little chilly here this morning, Lord, but you are here with us and your presence brings us all the warmth that we need. We thank you, Lord, for this message that we will hear this morning. We pray, Heavenly Father, you would anoint my tongue to declare this word clearly and we pray, Lord, that it would be a blessing to each and every one who hears it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we began John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is a rather long chapter. So we are breaking it down into sections. John chapter 6 begins with Jesus feeding 5,000 men plus. We say plus because we know there was a young boy there who had the five loaves and the, the fish to contribute to the food that day. In fact, I bet that was one thing that he told people over and over again as he grew up, is how the Lord Jesus took his five loaves and two fish and fed a multitude. That's something that would just never, ever leave you if something like that would happen. So we don't exactly know how many people were fed, but it was a bunch. And we do know that this was such a miracle that those who saw it came to the conclusion that Jesus was the prophet Moses spoke of whom the Lord would send after Moses from among God's people. Now surely Jesus was and he is a prophet. And he did come from the tribe of Judah. But he is, as we know, much more than a prophet and much more than Moses. Now we spent quite a bit of time talking about the test Jesus gave to Philip and the answers Philip and Andrew gave to Jesus as they pondered what to do about feeding all these people. But we, of course, know what happened. Jesus took those five loaves and two fish, or a few fish, thanks God for providing them, and then fed all those people. Now, we were also reminded last week that we are to be about doing what Jesus did. We're supposed to follow Jesus by his example, okay? And the fact that believers are to follow Jesus' example, that means we're supposed to follow him in word and in deed and sometimes in powerful deeds. Now, that isn't all that familiar to us because that's not something we have been taught, generally speaking, in the church. The church teaches the truth, but sometimes the church doesn't teach at all. Okay? Like following Jesus' examples to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, multiply food, and all this sort of stuff. It's all in the text that that's what we're supposed to do. But the church doesn't always follow by teaching that we're supposed to do that. And so there are a lot of people who end up thinking that those kinds of miracles ended with the disciples. They did not end. Just because we don't do them doesn't mean they end it. Okay? It means we need to get back to the Bible and start doing what God teaches us to do. Okay? Get back to the truth. Get back to the basics and do the things Jesus wants us to do. So, so that needs to become familiar to us. But I believe the most important thing about that miracle was this. Jesus took those five loaves and those few fish and raised them up to heaven and gave God thanks for them. He didn't, look, he didn't raise them up to heaven, look up to heaven and go, Oh God, there's just five loaves and two fish. No, he raised them up to heaven, thanked God for them, and the, and the Lord multiplied them. Okay? So I think that thanking God was the most important element in that whole thing. And so, that's where we are with that one. So, John 6 actually gives us 
John 6, 1 to 21 is what we did last week. We have two miracles. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 plus people, but also the miracle of Jesus' disciples getting from point A to point B in, you know, just a blink of an eye when Jesus got in the boat with them. And John doesn't take a whole lot of time to talk about that because that's not the point of this chapter. The point of this chapter is the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. That's the point of this chapter. And so we're going to turn to a little bit more of that right now. Beginning with verse 22. Our text begins on the following day, the day following Jesus feeding the multitude, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. That's a 94-word sentence. A ni- you know, John just keeps adding, oh, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this was going on. And so eventually a period shows up. All right? So anyway, so what God's Spirit through the Apostle John does, he gives us a lot of detail. You know, one of the things he says is the events about to transpire take place the very next day after the feeding of the multitude. And then the second thing is that You know, people, the people who had been fed, noticed that Jesus and his disciples only had one boat. And that the disciples got into that one boat and left for Capernaum, but Jesus had not gotten in the boat with them. Okay? So, uh, they are kind of wondering where Jesus is, but they know that the disciples are going to Capernaum. But their actions are interesting here, I think anyway, because... You know, they went to Capernaum looking for Jesus, but Jesus didn't get into the boat. And yet, since they saw Jesus head into the mountains after, you know, Jesus knew they'd probably make him king by force, I just started looking around in the area. Right? I just, you know, that's where Jesus was, so I'd be looking around that area for Jesus. These people, on the other hand, decided to go to Capernaum because... I think their thinking was this. Well, since his disciples went there, eventually Jesus would catch up to them in Capernaum. All right? So I had been looking in the wrong place. They were looking in the right place. Verse 25 says, And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now, I'm quite sure that would have been our question too. Right? Yeah. When did you get here? How did you get here? Okay? Um, you know, they know that he didn't come with the disciples, so what happened here? It was, a mystery. it was a mystery to them, and it was a mystery that Jesus did not answer. Instead, Jesus gives a very curious answer. He said, um, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Jesus cuts to the chase here, doesn't he? He knows men's hearts. He knows that people like their bellies filled, right? So he knows that these people wanted food for which they did not have to labor. It wasn't even about the sign. They wanted a handout. They wanted a handout. The next thing Jesus told them was, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set his seal on him. Now what labor is Jesus talking about here when he says do not labor for food which perishes? What labor had they done? Well, the labor these people had done for food which perishes was this. Under the appearance of looking for Jesus, these people came looking for another meal. That's 
the labor they were doing. They're going to follow Jesus to get another meal. Right? Okay. But we know this. One meal leads to the next meal, which leads to the next meal, which leads to the next meal, and so on. We know how that goes. As full as, full as we can be after a wonderful meal and as satisfying as that can be, that good meal is soon forgotten and we start to think, what are we going to eat next? <laughs> it's just like, right? It happens. It happens consistently several times a day. Right? Jesus said that this food perishes. It perishes. It, you know, it fills our stomach and then, you know, it seems like it just goes away. Jesus, on the other hand, had food to give them which would endure forever. They needed to get their attention off of food that perishes and onto him and what he could give them. They needed to labor for that food. So, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in whom he sent. Now, most of us probably do not think of believing in Jesus as a work. It isn't a work. Listen to what Jesus said. and Listen to his exact words. He said, this is the work of God. This is the work of God that you believe in whom he sent. This isn't something they would actually do or anything that we do. This is what God does in us. It's a work of God. Right? That's what Jesus says. He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. Okay? So this is why Jesus said just moments earlier, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food uh, which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. This is the food God desires to give everyone. And it is a food which lasts forever. It's not going to perish. It isn't going to disappear. You know, we don't have to go, well, where's the next meal coming? Because it lasts forever. In other words, the food Jesus gives will satisfy spiritual hunger forever. In response to what Jesus had said, in verse 30 we read, Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now isn't that amazing? Okay? What sign will you perform then? What work will you do? And we should be saying, what sign? What work is he going to do? Excuse me, just yesterday you ate bread and had your fill from five loaves and a few little fish. Okay? But remember last week I said, you know, we read some stuff there last week, for some verses there. It said, after these things, after Jesus had healed this infirm man, Jesus went to, over to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, he said a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. So I mentioned then we're going to need to remember that particular verse for this week. Now we know why. Here these people are asking for a sign that Jesus is going to do. What work is he going to do when the fact is they were following him because they saw the signs he was doing. I mean, I think these people aren't even listening to the words they're saying. All right? They're following him because they see the signs, and now they said, what sign are you going to do? What? What are they thinking? I mean, what more do they want? You know, what more does anyone want after seeing Jesus do the things that he has been doing, either in their own life or in, you know, the life of other people? But people ask this question all the time. I want more, or they say, I want more, I want more, I want more. Well, eventually, you just got to make a decision for or against Jesus. 
because the more and the more and the more never satisfied, eventually we've got to decide for or against Jesus. Sitting on the fence, teetering back and forth, waiting for more information and more signs and more wonders, that doesn't do it. Eventually you've got to decide. You know, we are either for him or against him. They wanted more. They wanted more. But Jesus clarifies their erroneous thinking and their erroneous theology. In verse 32, he said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Moses had no ability to give people bread from heaven. He was as much a recipient of that miracle that continued for 40 years as all the other people. Similarly, Moses did not have the ability to get water from a rock. And he did not have the ability to bring mega quantities of quail for people to eat when they were crying out for meat to eat. In fact, Moses, if we read the text back during, I think it's in the book of Numbers, uh, when the people were crying out for meat, Moses was even incredulous as to whether or not God could do that. And God is like, is my arm too short to supply this? No. They ended up with such a vast quantity of quail that really, I think for the most part, the quail was so deep it kind of came up to a person's knees and went out all over the camp. See, God is the giver. God is always the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Jesus identifies God in verse 32 as my Father. My Father. He says, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. He then identifies who, not what is the true bread. And that's in verse 33. For the bread of God is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It's not a what, it's a who. For the bread of God is he who get, comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The bread Jesus is talking about here is not made of flour and yeast and water. The bread he's talking about is he who comes down from heaven, who gives life to the world. Sounded good to these people. And so they said, Lord, give us this bread always. Well, they have made a very good request. And the answer Jesus gives is what we're going to turn to next week. Amen.